Hello and welcome back to Kaust Live. This afternoon we have a special Red Sea edition for you. Uh, the university's Red Sea Research Center has a workshop as well as a conference going on this weekend. And we wanted to bring one of the experts that they've brought to campus in to talk to us a little bit about coral reef ecology. Um, Dr. Terry Hughes is here with us uh, today. So thank you, Dr. Pleasure. for coming in. Um, you are the director of the ARC um, Center for uh, Coral Reef Studies um, at the James Cook University. So, so tell me a little bit about what that entails, what your work is there. Well, I direct uh, quite a large coral reef research center. So I'm here in Saudi Arabia because of the ongoing collaborations we have with coral reef researchers here at, at KAUST. Mm. Uh, so it's great to be back here. Um, we all have common research interests. The, the coral reef community is scattered uh, throughout the, the tropical world. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a unifying theme in our recent research is the challenge of global warming and climate change for coral reefs. And that's obviously not a local problem, that's a global challenge. Mm -hmm. So uh, in Australia, where I'm from, and in many other tropical countries around the world, we're, we're facing the challenge of marine heat waves. Uh, like we've seen in the last three hot summers, record-breaking temperatures, mm. and the threat that they pose to the world's coral reefs. Um, so here at the, the conference, uh, you gave a lecture. Uh, what, what were you speaking about specifically? I gave a talk on uh, our recent research on the Great Barrier Reef and elsewhere in Australia. Mm. Um, the Great Barrier Reef has uh, been quite severely impacted by uh, bouts of the phenomena called coral bleaching uh, in the last two summers. It's the first time we've seen back-to-back -back bleaching in both uh, 217 and 216. Mm -hmm. So coral bleaching is uh, a stress response. It's the corals telling us as researchers that they're not very happy. So you can make a coral bleach if you collect it, bring it into the laboratory, into an aquarium, and torture it. So if you make the water too hot or too cold, or if you make it too saline or add too much fresh water or sediment to it, the coral will respond by turning pale and then white. And a bleached coral is physiologically damaged, it's very sick, and if the bleaching is prolonged for more than a couple of months, then they start to die. So this phenomena of coral bleaching is well known uh, for many decades, uh, but only in recent decades have we seen bleaching at a regional or even a global scale. So 2016 was the warmest year on record for underwater temperatures in the tropics, and we've seen the third major global scale coral bleaching event, and it was particularly severe on the Great Barrier Reef. So from the organism level, explain how the, the bleaching actually happens. Okay, well, without getting too technical, um, corals are sort of like an upside-down giant jellyfish, mm. uh, except there's lots of individual jellyfish called polyps that make up the coral colony. Mm. Inside the tissue of the corals, there are microscopic algae. The technical name for them is zooxanthellae. Those algae are microscopic, but they're very important for the nutrition of the coral mm. because the algae collect energy from photosynthesis, from sunlight, and without those zooxanthellae, the, the coral is nutritionally compromised. It, mm. it basically can starve to death if the zooxanthellae die back. So when we get a marine heat wave, the population of algae that live inside the coral dies back. The algae actually give the coral its vibrant colors. So the yellows and reds and blues that, that you see snorkeling or diving o over a, a, a coral garden, mm. that color doesn't come from the animal part uh, of the coral colony. It comes from the plants, the mm. microscopic algae. So when they die back, the coral actually turns transparent, like an upside down jellyfish. And you can see through the tissue of the coral and the paleness is actually the calcium carbonate skeleton mm. underneath the translucent tissue. Mm. Normally you can't see the skeleton because the, the color of the algae masks it. Mm -hmm. So from the air then, these surveys that you did uh, all along the Great Barrier Reef, 
Uh, what did you see when you, when you flew over? Sure. So bleaching is incredibly conspicuous, uh, both underwater and from the air. Mm. But if you want to get the big picture of the, the geography of a bleaching event, uh, bearing in mind you only have a fairly narrow window to measure it because the bleaching uh, builds up slowly and then suddenly many corals are bleached and within a few weeks they start to die. So you only have about a month or so to record it. So the m most basic research question we began with was where is the bleaching happening and how severe is it? Mm. So the Great Barrier Reef is a very large coral reef system. It's the biggest in the world. The area of the Great Barrier Reef is about 350 thousand square kilometers so it's a little bit bigger than the area of the Red Sea. Mm. It's 2300 kilometers in length mm. and up to about 250 kilometers wide. So to get the big picture we took to the air. We chartered fixed-wing aircraft and a helicopter mm. and it takes about uh, seven or eight days to fly the length and breadth of the Great Barrier Reef in, mm. in a small plane or, or chopper. So we did that twice in March 2016, which is our peak summer uh, period, and again uh, in late February, early March this year when we had the second bleaching event. So those two aerial surveys gave us the big picture. Yeah. Um, so we were able to map out, as it were, the footprint of the bleaching. Yeah. There have been four major bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef since 1998. Uh, 1998 was the first one followed by 2002 okay. and now 2016 and, and 2017. Two of those years, 98 and 2016, were El Nino years where the temperatures are expected to be a little bit above average, but the other two were not. Mm. And that's a pattern we're seeing increasingly around the world. So historically, since bleaching events began at a regional scale in the 1980s, they've been linked to unusually hot El Nino summers. Mm. But increasingly in the last decade in particular, we're seeing more and more bleaching events outside of El Nino periods in other parts of the so-called Enso cycle, even in La Nina periods, which are mm. a little bit cooler. Mm. And the reason for that is that El Nino temperatures today are actually warmer, uh, sorry, La Nina temperatures today, mm. which are slightly cooler than average, are actually warmer now than La Nina temperatures were, El Nino temperatures were, sorry, um, 30 or 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. So all, all phases of ENSO cycles are, are, are warming mm -hmm. through time over the, over the last few decades. Mm -hmm. And the, the prediction from the climate modelers is that if we don't deal with climate change and rapidly rising temperatures quickly, mm -hmm. we'll eventually see annual bleaching events occurring in about 30 or 40 years from now. Mm -hmm. So the take-home message is we have a narrowing window of opportunity to tackle greenhouse gas emissions and to deal with, with climate change. Yeah. So I'm reasonably optimistic that we can actually do that. We now have a mechanism following the COP21 Paris Agreement mm -hmm. uh, with targets of one and a half to two degrees of, of global warming that uh, many, many countries have agreed to. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously there's no time um, to lose because these bleaching events are very damaging. Yeah, um, and so that, that gets a lot at temperature, but uh, I believe that's not the only uh, factor that, that uh, causes the stresses and, and ultimately the bleaching. What are the other uh, stressors? For yeah, temperature is overwhelmingly the cause of, okay. of, of bleaching. Mm -hmm. um, so there are other elements of climate change that are of concern, uh, but, but temperature is the big one. Okay. So in the longer term ocean acidification, which is the absorption of CO2 from the atmosphere in, into the, the ocean, uh, will be a problem if we don't deal with rising greenhouse gas emissions. But it's very clear now from mm. the last uh, couple of record-breaking summers that the main threat is global warming. And by the time ocean acidification were to become a problem at the end of the century with, with unfettered greenhouse gas emissions, most of the coral reefs of the world would be dead because they they can't deal with the temperature. The temperature would have yeah, taken so it, the, yeah. So the immediate threat is temperature. There are other issues like rising sea level, which can affect reefs, but mm. it 
frankly, it affects people a lot more than reefs with coastal inundation and and issues like that than, than any threat to the corals. Another issue is uh, severe weather events, um, cyclones and hurricanes, which can be destructive to corals, but equally they're destructive to people. Mm -hmm. So, um, as I said, I'm reasonably optimistic um, that the penny has dropped, as it were, in relation to the threat of global warming and climate change, not just to nature, but mm -hmm. also to societies and economies. So mm -hmm. more and more people are m being motivated to deal with the issue. Mm -hmm. Well, what are the, uh, so, so you guys did your aerial surveys and then you actually got in the water and did uh, verification, spot verification, I believe. Yeah, right? the vast majority of our research was in fact underwater. Oh, okay. So so the aerial surveys were once off at the peak of the bleaching mm -hmm. and narrow time window where we describe the geography. Mm -hmm. the, the bigger question uh, can only be answered underwater. So mm -hmm. we were interested in the longer term effects on the corals and particularly on the, the biodiversity of the reef and how the reef functions. It turns out that bleaching is incredibly selective. So mm -hmm. it affects some species of corals much more than others. Mm -hmm. So that's important because it can change the mix of species, different species have different roles, they perform different functions. So mm -hmm. when you change the mix of species, you, you get a very different kind of reef and, with and, a different dynamic. And so in that shot that they were just showing there, uh, it still shows some unbleached corals, it still shows uh, some fish life. What are the knock-on effects uh, of that, that sort of specialized bleaching in a way. Sure, so when the corals bleach, two things can happen in mm -hmm. the six months or so following the bleaching. They can either regain their color because the algae inside their tissues regrow, and that depends in part on how quickly the water cools off. Um, or if that doesn't happen, they, they'll die. They'll, they'll starve without their, their zoosanthelae. So mm -hmm. in the northern 700 kilometer stretch of the Great Barrier Reef where the bleaching was the most extreme because that's where the hot water was mm -hmm. in 2016, we lost about two thirds of the corals. They died between March and October following um, the bleaching event. But you're right, some of the corals didn't bleach mm -hmm. and many of the corals that did bleach regained their color and survived. So that, that filtering, that difference between the so-called winners and losers mm -hmm. among the corals is a source of resilience for the future. Mm -hmm. So after two major bleaching events, the Great Barrier Reef will never look quite the same again. It's an altered system. Mm -hmm. uh, we're now seeing the very, very early stages of recovery. Uh, we're hoping, of course, for a big gap between the bleaching event that we've just seen this year in 2017 and the next one. It takes about 10 years for the fastest growing corals, if they're badly damaged, to fully recover. Yeah. So that's the kind of uh, trajectory of recovery that we're dealing with. But this time we lost many 50 and 100 year old corals. Yeah. And sadly we're not going to get a 50 or 100 year gap between our most recent fourth event on the Great Barrier Reef and the next fifth one, yeah. which hopefully won't be next summer. Um, so we'll get a, a reasonable gap to allow that recruitment uh, recovery to, to occur. Yeah. So looking on the bright side, um, there are many billions of corals left on the Great Barrier Reef that survived yeah. the back-to-back -back bleaching. Um, they, by definition, are hardier than the ones that bleached and died. Mm. They're not the same mix of species as before, so there is at least a potential for this kind of toughening up um, process. All of those surviving corals will be spawning in about 10 days from now, and they'll produce a trillion juvenile baby corals that is the next generation. So our research now, starting next week, will be focusing less on the gloom and doom and describing how many corals died and hopefully looking at the trajectory of recovery into, mm -hmm. into coming years. Do you expect that other varieties of corals are gonna kind of jump in to fill that void in the ecological, um, you know, in, into the system in general? How, how do that? Yeah, no, we, well, we've already seen mm -hmm. um, 
uh, a change in the mix of species because some survive better than others. Mm -hmm. When coral recovery takes place, you see a different uh, mechanism also causing a change in the mix of species. Mm -hmm. So the ones that are, are quick to uh, recolonize a reef, the ones that breed better, the ones that disperse better, that travel from one reef to the next, the ones that grow faster, they'll be favored over the next few years. So mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see two kinds of filters happening, a filter on the way down if you like, uh, and a different filter on the way up. So mm -hmm. the mix of species is changing very quickly. Is there, um, I, I wonder, is there a precedent for that? Like, uh, in the same way that they do ice core studies, is there a way to look back uh, far in time to these coral reefs and see other events that were like this or how the reefs would have responded? Um, yeah, uh, there is. Um, mm. So reefs have a very good fossil record. Mm. So we can look to the fossil record, including the very recent fossil record, where the same species that are alive today are preserved in, in recently uh, formed geological structures. And mm. we can measure the, the mix of species historically. So yes, we know from the fossil record that um, reefs can reassemble um, probably the best record comes from earthquake zones where reefs are suddenly lifted out of the water, become high and dry and everything dies and then you get a recolonization uh, in shallow water and that can happen repeatedly. So we know that reefs are resilient mm. but we have to be aware that that fossil evidence didn't include seven point something billion people. So um, that's a huge shift in the dynamics of reefs and how they behave today. So reefs are learning to cope, if you like, with people. And of course, it's not just climate change that, that we're the major cause of, mm -hmm. uh, but it's also issues like overfishing and pollution, and those things are ongoing in many places. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the good news is we know what the issues are affecting reefs, so the, the three big things almost everywhere are pollution, overfishing and recurrent bleaching due to global warming. We know the solutions to those mm -hmm. and in places where we've trialled those solutions they actually do work. So if we establish marine parks we can restore depleted fo fish populations. Mm -hmm. If we deal with uh, runoff and pollution from land, we can reduce the amount of sediment and pesticides and herbicides and nutrients that's flowing onto a reef. That's not a big issue in Saudi Arabia because you don't have the rainfall. Mm. But where I come from, we have huge tropical floods that produce vast amounts of sediment that's washed onto near shore parts of the Great Barrier Reef. We know how to deal with those problems and we also know how to deal with climate change and now for the first time we have the COP21 mechanism. So the message as a biologist that I like to propagate is things are bad for coral reefs globally around the world but we shouldn't lose hope. We actually know the recipe for sustaining reefs and securing a future for them mm. into the future for future human generations, for our kids and grandkids, mm. um, there's no time to lose and we need to get on with that job. So when you come here, um, I don't know how much you actually get out on the Red Sea, but you obviously collaborate with KAUST colleagues. Yeah. Well, um, what, what sorts of things do you collaborate about um, and how, you know, what's the utility in, in uh, sharing information? Well, uh, as I said at, at the outset, um, global warming and the response of reefs um, it, it is a global research challenge, so mm -hmm. researchers all over the world are co collaborating on that. The Red Sea has some interesting uh, features um, that make it um, a kind of a test case for studying global warming. The temperatures in the Red Sea historically uh, and even now are, are very high, and, and the water temperatures are also rising in the Red Sea faster than many parts uh, of the tropics. So global warming is certainly not uniform. So the northern Great Barrier Reef, for, for instance, is warming at only half the rate of the southern Great Barrier Reef. The Red Sea is warming faster than either of those. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting from uh, learning about the biology of bleaching to go to places with different heating histories, mm -hmm. different evolutionary histories, because the corals are responding. The, they're genetic makeup is shifting because of the selection that's happening from these recurrent uh, 
bleaching events. So the Red Sea offers many research opportunities to look at issues like that. Um, the Red Sea is also a so-called biodiversity hotspot. It's got a lot of species of nearly everything. Um, so it's comparable in its biodiversity to the Great Barrier Reef. Um, it's much more diverse than uh, other regions near Saudi Arabia. And do, are there a lot of shared species in, in that respect? Or? Yes, there are. So mm -hmm. that's an interesting element of global warming. So corals ha are very widely distributed. Mm -hmm. If you look at a map of the world and map out where an individual coral species is found, very few of them have a restricted um, set of locations. So many of the species on the Great Barrier Reef, the vast majority, are also found around Australia. And indeed, some of them go halfway across the Pacific Ocean as mm. far as Tahiti and French Polynesia. So um, that we refer to that as their geographic range. Mm. And corals, uh, many of them have very large geographic ranges. Mm. Um, there are also um, uh, f quite a few uh, coral species and fish species uh, and other types of animals um, that are found only in the Red Sea. Mm. Uh, we would call those endemic species. So the Red Sea is, is both a hotspot for biodiversity and a hotspot for endemicity, the special species that are only found here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and talk a little bit about the environments, not just the reef themselves, but how they interact with shoreline, with mangroves and, and other things. Is that at all part of your, your work? or? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, one of the main uh, ways that people interact with coral reefs is obviously through the coastal zone. Mm -hmm. So the coast is where um, most human migration and buildup of population is, is occurring. And indeed Saudi Arabia has very ambitious plans for uh, developing tourism and aquaculture and, and other activities. Uh, al along the uh, the coast of the, of the Red Sea, we need to manage those activities carefully. Mm -hmm. um, in Australia, we have seen very considerable impacts of pollution from land affecting uh, so-called fringing reefs, reefs that fringe the coastline. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're the most vulnerable reefs compared to reefs that are more distant, uh, further offshore or in, in deeper water. Mm -hmm. The difference between Queensland, where I live, and Saudi Arabia is the rainfall. So we get two or three or four meters of rain per annum. Um, it's very episodic. Mm -hmm. So when the rivers flow and some of them dry up in our dry season, they turn into huge torrents and they deliver a lot of sediment. You don't have that issue here because it mm. doesn't rain enough. Mm. Um, but there are other coastal issues that need to be carefully managed. Mm. Um, so what, what is the, the future of this research then as you see it? What is the, the in the near future, how, how do you um, better inform uh, policy? How do you better inform the science about, about coral reef? Yeah, I, I'm actually I'm often asked by my students mm -hmm. and, and others, what's the future for the next generation of, of coral reef scientists? Because mm -hmm. they read in the newspaper that a third of the Great Barrier Reef corals died last year, which is certainly true. My argument is that there's never been a greater need for c coral reef science and, and knowledge about how to sustain coral reefs into the future. Uh, I think we can secure that future, uh, but we need to recognize that coral reef ecosystems are, are changing. They have changed in the last 30 years, mm -hmm. and they will continue to change. The trick is to make sure they don't change so much that they become unrecognizable. So the challenge is to sustain coral reefs that uh, are, are functional, that deliver to societies the the benefits that we currently get from it. And bear in mind that most coral reefs are in uh, relatively poor, small developing countries, um, much smaller than certainly Australia or Saudi Arabia, um, that don't have the wealth of either of those two countries. For those small developing countries, coral reefs are absolutely critical for food security. Mm. 
and for income from a global coral reef tourism industry. Uh, even in Australia, tourism on the Great Barrier Reef is a $5 billion industry and it employs 65,000 people. So that's an economic and uh, a political reason for sustaining uh, those natural resources and the benefit they provide to us. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, Terry, thank you so much for coming in to, to speak with us today and, and best of luck in the future with your research. Thank you very much. Thank you to our Facebook audience for, for joining us. This has been a very exciting conversation. We'll bring these to you as often as we can, particularly as uh, highly cited researchers like Terry come to campus. Thank you and have a good afternoon.